Let us worship the eternal God, the source of love and life, who creates us. Let us worship Jesus Christ, the risen one who lives among us. Let us worship the Spirit, the holy fire who renews us. To the one true God be praise in all times and places through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we gather together, we know that our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And our grace to you and peace from God Almighty and Jesus Christ, our Lord, through the powerful work of God's Holy Spirit. Amen. has re revealed God's self to us as a loving, merciful, and forgiving God. And therefore, we may approach God confessing our sins, knowing that God is ready to forgive, ready to start new with us. Let us pray. Almighty God, you love us, but we have not loved you. You call, but we have not listened. We walk away from neighbors in need, wrapped in our own concerns. We condone evil, prejudice, warfare, and greed. God of grace, help us to admit our sin, so that as you come to us in mercy, we may repent, turn to you, and receive forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. People of God, hear this good news based on 1 Timothy chapter 1. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. 
to the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. I can proclaim to you that your sins are forgiven. Believe this, for it is good news. And then the question is, how do we respond? How do we show our gratitude for God's love and grace and mercy and forgiveness? These words in Matthew chapter 5 give us good guidance on how we ought to live. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. El Salter reading from Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is in my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. Oh, that you would kill the wicked, O God, and that the bloodthirsty would depart from me. Those who speak of you maliciously and lift themselves up against you for evil. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. for a word for the children. I wonder, did any of you play outside in the snow this week? The next time you are out sledding or making snowmen, I want you to take a big, deep breath into your lungs and feel that chilly air filling you up. 
As you do this, imagine inviting the Holy Spirit to fill you. Last week, we talked about being filled with the Spirit and receiving blessings from God. Remember, Jesus has a job for all those filled with the Spirit. We are a part of God's story, so this is our job too. Jesus wants us to bring God into the world, just as he did. Everywhere we go, we are asked to let God go with us. How do we do this? If we are going to bring God into the world, we need to understand who God is. Our Bible story from Acts tells about a time when Paul introduced a group of people in Athens to God. The Athenians worshipped many gods, and while visiting, Paul noticed they built an altar to the unknown God. Paul brought God into the world by telling the people of Athens that he knew the unknown God. Paul described God as a creator of all that exists. He told them God is a spiritual being. God is powerful and invisible. God is forever and completely wise. God is just and good. God is not far from us and is eager for humans to know him and find him. God wants to have a relationship with his people. Paul bravely introduced a group of strangers to God, and we can do this too if we let the Holy Spirit be our guide. The Spirit is a guide who brings the love of God right to us, the Spirit teaches us how to forgive and how to be honest with each other. Jesus tells his disciples the Spirit will guide them in all truth. And the Spirit points us to Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. The Holy Spirit will always point us in the right direction. The job of bringing God into the world of sharing with others, this is not an easy thing to do. Why? What stands in our way? I have noticed that people are slow to share because they worry about what they are giving up. Even though God gives to us abundantly, this fear of not enough is pretty common. So I have an idea. Why don't we start by sharing blessings from God that we can never run out of. Two of the greatest blessings are love and truth. No matter how much love you give others, we never run out. In fact, love multiplies. The same can be said of truth. The love we share creates even more love in the world, and sharing the truth creates trust. Trust in people, but also trust in God. Trusting God allows us to believe that God's blessings are meant for all people. When this happens, we are no longer afraid to share with others because we know the supply of love and truth from God is endless. Let us pray. Dear God, in you we live and move and exist. We are your children. Let us always reach for you because that is when we will find your love, your truth, and be filled with your guiding spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In thanksgiving, consider Psalm 100. We know that the Lord is God. It is God who has made us, 
We are God's. We enter the Lord's gates with thanksgiving and God's courts with praise. Now give thanks to God and bless God's name. Let us pray. Blessed are you, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever. Amen. of God, our first reading is from the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 64, verses 1 through 12. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to our adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down. The mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry, and we sinned. Because you hit yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. Your holy cities have become a wilderness. Zion has become a wilderness. Jerusalem, a desolation. Our holy and beautiful house, where our ancestors praised you, has been burned by fire, and all our pleasant places have become ruins. After all this, will you restrain yourself, O Lord? Will you keep silent and punish us so severely? And then a reading from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, verses 16 through 34. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and also in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Also some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. So this was because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and brought him to the Areopagus and asked him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? It sounds rather strange to us, so we would like to know what it means. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. 
Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some scoffed, but others said, We will hear you again about this. At that point Paul left them, but some of them joined him and became believers, including Dionysius, Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris and others with him. Gospel reading from the Gospel according to John, chapter 16, verses 4 through 15. But I have said these things to you, so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you about them. I did not say these things to you from the beginning, because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because they do not believe in me, about righteousness, because I am going to the Father, and you will see me no longer, about judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The earliest form of writing appeared approximately 5,000 years ago. And from the earliest writings, we find evidence of the existence of religion. It is generally accepted that societies practiced various forms of religions 
long before they had written things down. So religion is most likely as old as the human race. The ancient Greek philosopher Plutarch said, and I quote, You may find communities without walls, without letters, without kings, without money, without theaters, but a community without holy right, without a God that uses no prayer, without sacrifice to win good or avert evil, no man ever saw or ever will see. The concept of God in ancient times came in many shapes and forms, from animals to heavenly bodies, from wooden poles to human figures. Ancient people felt that no single deity could possibly take care of all the needs of everyone. So they needed many gods with smaller and manageable portfolios. Ancient Greek had a polytheistic religion with many gods and goddesses. Their temple was called, as you know, the Pantheon. And the word Pantheon literally means all gods. Israel's religion deviated from those of her neighbors. Israel's was monotheistic. God was one. Israel believed that God was the creator of heaven and earth, animals, and human beings. And only God is to be worshipped. One of the most remarkable differences in Israel's understanding of her God was that God is a relational being. God entered into a relationship with human beings. First with Adam and Eve, and later on with Abraham, the ancestor of the people of Israel. And this relationship, of course, is called a covenant. God chooses to be the God of Israel, and God wants Israel to be God's people. And this covenant implied certain privileges and certain responsibilities. In our reading from the prophet Isaiah, we come across what is considered to be the most powerful psalm of communal lamentation in the entire Bible. The psalm actually starts in chapter 63, verse 13. It is a prayer for God to intervene, for they are deeply aware that God's mercy is lost. And the original setting was the fall of Jerusalem in the year 587 before the Common Era. But as it is now, the background in this chapter is different. From the year 537 before the Common Era, the Jewish people in Babylon were allowed to go back to Jerusalem, back to the Promised Land. They had longed to go back to their land, but now the future seemed uncertain and their economic troubles were severe. And the only place they could find refuge was in God, their Father. This is the only psalm where God is viewed as a Father, a living and present Father. God knows them. God acknowledges them. God sees them. They may call upon God, and God is expected to turn in grace towards God's children. A closer reading of the prophet Isaiah reveals that this relationship between God and Israel is an honest one, even brutally honest. God was angry. God hid God's face from them. And what kindled God's wrath was Israel's unfaithfulness and her transgression. The reason Israel had been in exile in Babylon and what was causing her difficulties now was her transgressions and her unfaithfulness. 
You see, they were called to be God's people. They were supposed to know and do what was right. Instead, they who were in a close relationship with God acted, promoted, and tolerated actions that were not compatible with their status as God's children. And God being true to God's nature and true to the relationship with Israel was now being honest with them. They did not abide by what God had asked of them. And now there are consequences. We see how serious God is about the relationship with Israel. And it also shows us how honest God is with God's people. And God is as serious and honest with us. When God requires of us to do justice, to love our neighbor, to care for the weak, the marginalized, honor our parents, speak the truth, and respect others, God wants us to do what God requires. And if we don't do what God requires, God does not approve, and there are consequences. Isn't this true for all relationships? If one party does wrong and the other one pretends everything is fine, such a relationship is not honest. One has to be honest to address the wrongs. One has to work to make sure it does not happen again. And sometimes one must suffer consequences. We as human beings are also relational beings, and our relationship with God and others need to be honest too. We need to be brutally honest with God about where we fail and what our sins and shortcomings are. It is only when we are, when we are honest and honestly face our sins that we can start new. And this honesty also transfers to our relationship with each other. There will be times when we have to look at ourselves and assess the integrity of our decisions and actions. We need to acknowledge our part in the condition of our relationships. How did I contribute to the deterioration of interpersonal or communal relationships? I mentioned it last week, but it is important enough to repeat. We have to be honest and courageous to admit that we too are to blame for the disunity and disharmony in our personal and communal life. But we also have to be honest to point out actions of others that are harmful and wrong. This is our prophetic responsibility. As the psalm continues, we see that the downtrodden people of Israel confess their sins. We read, We sinned. We have all become one who is unclean. There is talk about our iniquities. They acknowledge the fact that God is the potter and they are the clay, the work of God's hand. You see, the healing starts when they are honest and when they acknowledge their sins. An honest assessment of our condition and the confessing of our sins are needed for renewal. At the same time, Isaiah is clear that when we confess our sins, God is more than ready to forgive. God maintains the relationship with us, for it is important to God, and God wants us to take this relationship seriously as well by doing what is right, just, and honest in God's eyes. So honesty is called for in our relationship with God and with each other. In the reading of John's Gospel, Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure. The disciples are filled with paralyzing sadness. 
And now Jesus is comforting them, pointing out that his departure would actually be to their advantage. Jesus will send the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, to them. The Advocate will lead the community to understand who Jesus is and what he did. And Jesus will be present in the community through the work of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit will end, put an end to their paralyzing sadness and replace it with action and joy. And as Jesus continues, we see that the Advocate will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears from Jesus. He will, in other words, confirm Jesus' relationship with the Father who sent Jesus. And the relationship between Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit is a harmonious one. And then Jesus says, the Advocate will lead and guide the community in the truth. Truth refers, first of all, to the gospel of Jesus. And then the Spirit will guide us into all the truth. John defines truth also as an action. Truth has to be done. People need to walk in the truth. Truth should define everything we do and everything we are. Some commentators have pointed out that we live in a time when truth is being attacked. News is fake. Misinformation is common on social media, and conspiracy theories range from vaccine to climate change. Concepts like alternative facts have entered our lexicon, and some are openly saying that truth is not truth anymore. For any community and any relationship to be harmonious, sound, and to function properly, you have to be able to rely on truth and facts. Lies and information harm communities, and they harm relationships. That is why people who care about the relational nature of our species should have a holy passion for the truth. This is one of the reasons why God gives the commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. When you lie to your neighbor, it harms her, for it presents to her a world that is not reliable. When you present to him facts that are not based on reality, you deceive him. As Christians, there is another important aspect to the seriousness of attacking the truth. If lies are presented as the truth, it harms my neighbor and it harms me, for it destroys the legitimacy of my witness to the truth. If my word is not dependable, how can I witness about the truth that we find in Jesus. If we don't walk in the truth, if I dabble with untruth or lies, how can I be a reliable messenger of the truth, the way, and the life? If I am not truthful, then people will not be able to learn that God is trustworthy. So, people of God, this is serious business. Our relationship with God and our neighbors should be honest, and it should be truthful. If people cannot rely on my word, then it is harmful. I suspect that all of us, over the next years, will have an important calling to serve the truth. For we as people of faith are called to serve both the truth, truth with a capital T, and the truth. 
our serving God and our neighbor is closely linked to the truth and the one who is called the truth. In Acts chapter 17, the apostle finds himself in Athens. And this was where the Athenians spent their days doing what intellectuals enjoy, searching for new ideas. Novelty attracts their attention more quickly than truth. And the apostle finds common grounds with the Athenians. He points out an altar to, no, to the unknown God. And one commentator explains that such an altar to an unknown God was to make sure that all your bases are covered, to make sure you appease an unknown God from somewhere that was perhaps left out of the pantheon. And this unknown God, Paul proclaims to them, the Creator God, the Lord of heaven and earth, in Him we live and move and have our being. And once again, Paul finds common ground when he says, even as one of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. You see, Paul finds common ground with the Athenians. It is not far-fetched to conclude that he respects them and loves them for God's sake. Remember that it's the same man who wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 through 22, which state, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. You see, Paul respected others. Yes, relationships should be honest. It should be based on the truth, and it should be respectful of others. Now, this does not mean that we will always agree on everything. When Paul talked to the Athenians about the Creator God, they were very interested. However, as soon as he talked about the resurrection, some of them joined and became believers. Others disagreed and scoffed for Jesus being raised from the dead was too far-fetched for them. So let me conclude. We worship a God who is very serious about and committed to the relationship with us. God requires of us to reflect God good, God's goodness and holiness. God's relationship with us should shape our relationship with God and with our neighbors. God calls us to be honest, truthful, and respectful of others, even if, perhaps especially if, they disagree with us. And I suspect that honesty, a passion for the truth, and a respect of others will help in the renewing work that is so needed for our world. Amen.
Let us affirm our faith in the words based on Colossians chapter 1. Our Lord has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things were created. God is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Christ is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything our Lord might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God, for it is holy and right to do so. O God, whom to know is to love, and whom to love is to find true life, you have invited us to pray to you. So this morning we do that, and through the good and strong name of Jesus Christ our Lord. We are grateful that you have kept us safe through another week. We thank you that you have protected many of us on snowy and icy roads, even as we remain glad for the blessing of shelter during winter months and always. For furnaces that warm us, for storm windows that provide a buffer between the cold and us, for sweaters and blankets we can wrap around ourselves, for coats and mittens to wear when we do go outdoors, for all these blessings, and for the money we have to purchase it, in a, it all in the first place, we render to you, our provider God, our thanks and praise. But we are mindful, too, of the many people in, in this place whose shelters are inadequate, if they have a roof over their heads at all. We cannot be grateful for the ways you provide for us, for most of us, O oh God, without praying for your providence in the lives of the needy. In your good name, help your people always to be reaching out, and in so doing, to be the hands and fingers of you, O oh God. This morning, we also thank you for this church family. We thank you that we belong and care for each other during these most difficult times. When frustration and problems present themselves, grant a wisdom and clarity of vision that can help. We petition for other needs in this place as well, O oh Lord. Continue to be with our sick and suffering members and many others who feel depressed, saddened, and worried about all the suffering in the world. We continue to pray for Carolyn Cromer, Craig DeRusso, Karen Dixon, who will have surgery on Monday, Sharon and Bob Ryder, our homebound members, and everyone who has been affected by the pandemic. We pray for all refugees, victims of natural disasters, war, and violence. Be with all of us who have been living in the presence of death for almost a year now. Deliver us from this pandemic, we pray. We pray for the frontline and essential workers. Protect them and give them everything they need to do their work. Be with those who suffer in silence. Stand near those who are haunted by bad memories or who bear the scars of abuse that happened years ago but still lingers with fresh effects each new morning. Fortify those who experience panic attacks, who feel afraid all the time without knowing why. Lend light to those who pass their days in gloomy clouds of depression. Signal your love to those who sometimes feel so frustrated at the way life is turning out that they scarcely know what to do with themselves. Be with our young people who are suffering too. Life in this world is now hard for all, dear God. Some days are just plain miserable. The gospel tells us you understand this firsthand through Jesus our Lord. Remind us of this compassion and shower us with your love, especially on days when the love of other people seems remote or spotty at best. 
Yet there are joys too, and we thank you for those gifts. There are good days too, and we aim our praise for such time to you first and foremost. You, O God, have been our help in the past, and you are our bright hope for years to come. You have brought us to the blessing of a new morning. Grant us your presence and support us all the day long until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed. We pray for your world and all those places that need your grace, your mercy, and your peace. We pray for our country and the new administration. Give courage, wisdom, compassion, and the world to do what is good and just for all. And now we pray that you give all of us the courage to be honest, committed to the truth, and respectful to all. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying in one voice, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. us as relational beings. Let us be honest, truthful, and respectful in all our relationships. And as you do so, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God Almighty, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.